the first two bills on our agenda to form our jobs and economic development omnibus bill. We are using House File 1342 as the vehicle for this package, but we will start by reviewing House File 1670, the Labor and Industry Budget Bill, which will be laid over after discussion. Chair Eklund, please move your bill before the committee and tell us about your budget, and then we will come back to your author's amendment after your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair's members. I move House File 1670 to be laid over. Madam Chair members, House File 1670 is Omnibus Labor and Finance Policy Bill. This bill is mainly stepping up efforts to protect Minnesota workers who have had to endure the roughest year in recent memory. House File 1670 contains several important policy bills that protect Minnesota workers in a variety of ways. The appropriations in House File 1670 are modest as very little of the Department of Labor Industries budget comes from the general fund. The Department of Labor and Industry does get an increase of $4.4 million to cover the important, uh, to cover the department costs for the uh, policy bills contained. The Bureau of Mediation Service gets an increase in funding, which will allow the Public Employee Relations Board to start handling labor disputes. PERB was authorized in two, 2014, but has never been funded. Article one is the appro appropriation portion of the bill. Ms. Roberts from House Fiscal Staff is available to answer any questions on the, on the spreadsheet, as well as Ms. James from House Research for any technical questions. Article two is a labor and industry policy article. It makes OSHA citations data, public data. This bill closes a loophole on child labor data that was allowed to be released. The bill brings the state into federal conformity on apprenticeship programs. It is also adds an individual from the energy conservation industry to the construction codes advisory council. Section nine contains provisions for nursing mothers in the workforce. Section 12 puts the requirements on training requirements for contractors that work on refineries. Section 21 is the sprinkler system requirements for high-rise apartments. Section 29 allows law enforcement su supervisors to form their own collective bargaining unit. Article three contains the language of earned sick and safe time. This uh, language is developed from more than a dozen states that have passed this into law and is modeled after policies implemented by the cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth. It is estimated 36% of the workforce in the state do not have earned sick and safe time available to, them to use their workplace. Article four is earned sick and safe time enforcement article. Article five is the emergency rehire and retention portion of the bill. The employees in the hospitality industry have borne the brunt of the pandemic and at this time approximately 39% have still not been rehired. This language allows workers laid off since January 2020 be called back without loss of seniority. The vast majority of these employees are people of color. Without this policy, workers who have lost their employment through no fault of their own often face a more daunting task to re-enter the job force. Article six contains the essential workers emergency leave language of the bill. Essential workers have kept Minnesota safe and healthy while ensuring stability in our economy during the pandemic. Many essential workers are forced to use their PTO, dip into retirement, or even go without pay when having to quarantine so that they can keep the public safe, care for family that was diagnosed with COVID-19, or parent a child who does not have access to in-person schooling or child care. The Essential Workers Emergency Leave Act will make it right, ensuring that frontline workers have the financial security to continue protecting and caring for Minnesotans. Article nine addresses the workplaces for uh, meat and poultry, uh, poultry processing workers. I, excuse me, I think I said article nine, article seven. In the best of times, meat and poultry processing workers are more likely to be injured than in many other private industry or manufacturing jobs. Meat and poultry processing workers are essential workers. This industry was and is important enough to keep our country open that the Defense of Production Act was invoked to keep these plants open. These workers, many, many of whom are people of color, need, need and deserve a safe and healthy workplace, not just during a pandemic or a national crisis, but now and well into the future. 
And that is a brief summary of the bill, Madam Speaker and members. I will stand for questions. Well, thank you, Chair Eklund. Uh, would you like to move your AC, uh, A6 author of amendment now and explain it to us? Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, the A6 amendment, uh, I'll, I'll move the A6 amendment. And what that amendment does is it, it takes out the portion of the bill that we passed on the House floor yesterday, which was the uh, manufactured homes uh, continuing education portion, Madam Chair. All right. All right, thank you. Members, are there any questions on the amendment? If not, Chair Ecklins renew his motion to adopt the A6 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Okay, uh, members, are there any uh, questions to Chair Eklund or nonpartisan staff on the bill? Uh, Madam Chair, I see a hand up from Representative Bertos. Representative oh, Bertos. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And um, I don't have a comment about the bill at this moment, but I did want to comment, and many of us had our hand up during your opening statement, your opening comment. I want to thank you for your heartfelt words and concerns about the incident that occurred in Brooklyn Center. I also want you to know and understand that our concerns for the safety of our children transcends color. It applies to all of us. And I, as a young person, had my own encounters with law enforcement. And when my son reached an age of 20 and seen some of the behaviors in him similar to my own, I reminded him of the importance of following lawful orders if you are pulled over by police. Because I learned how quickly things can escalate. And um, I just wanted you to be aware that this is not unique people of color and that all of us have concerns for the safety of our children. And I can't stress enough the importance of young men, young males, including my own, uh, that I had to have very serious, heartfelt conversations, particularly when being pulled over for routine traffic stops, to be compliant and follow directions and uh, just move on. You can take it further after the fact, but thank you, Madam. Representative Nash. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I was wondering if uh, I could ask Chair Eklund a question about one of the provisions in his bill. Um, and I'm driving, so uh, I don't know if you can hear me really well. I'm just uh, pulling into the parking ramp. But uh, Representative Eklund, well, Representative in, Nash, uh, article regarding pipeline safety or uh, Representative Nash, the, Re Representative article Nash, twelve or Article Two. Representative Nash, we're having some yes, difficulties. We're having some difficulties understanding you. Um, let's try it one more time and see what happens. I, yes. I did, yeah, we're having some difficulties. Yes, okay, we're gonna try to come back to Representative um, Nash. Representative, Madam, Representative Nash. Can you hear me now? Well, I heard that. Um, we're going to try one more time. Otherwise, we're going to have to move on and try to come back when you get to a, a place that you are able to get some clarity in, in what you're trying to share with us. So, Representative so, Representative Nash, I, I cannot, we cannot uh, understand you. So, I'm going to have to move on. Okay, I'm sorry, but you're not coming through clear. So, we're going to move on right now to uh, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you just perfectly. Okay. So, uh, well, good morning. And uh, Representative Eklund, um, there are um, numerous uh, 
provisions in your bill that I have concerns with. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because I think we I think we understand this is the time in session where sometimes bills are just uh, proposed to demonstrate some people's support for them, but we we recognize that there's real no there's little to no chance of uh, those provisions becoming law. Um, so when it comes to uh, the state of the unemployment insurance trust fund, can you elaborate on um, what the the current status of the unemployment insurance trust fund is in terms of uh, its deficit and what the extra costs are that are being imposed in this bill? Chair sure, Eklund. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Garofalo. I believe that the unemployment insurance trust fund will be covered in the next bill with uh, Chair Noor. I, I don't have the UI trust fund in my under my purview. Oh, well, it certainly, it certainly makes our conversation less interesting then, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> um, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, I lose track of when bills are merged together. So the, this, uh, so the NOR provisions are going to be merged later in, Madam Chair, is that correct? Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. And uh, Madam Chair, Representative Eklund, I think, uh, um, I don't know if Representative Nash is back on yet or not, but I believe what I heard him asking questions about uh, were the requirements for uh, the List Lagarde bill that was uh, it's House File 984, where the situation down in uh, like the oil refinery is requiring apprenticeship level training. I believe that's what I heard him asking about. And maybe maybe Representative Nash is back uh, now in a little more of a. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. So, Rep Madam Chair, I'll just I'll defer my questions to Representative well, Nash. All I want to say to you, Representative Garofalo, is that you have an excellent ear if you understood what he was saying. I am, that is like incredible. But I appreciate that. Uh, Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members. Sorry for the, the interruption there. Um, Representative Eklund, I, I was reading through the bill and saw the requirements for folks to work at refineries. And could you walk us through what those requirements are and how you arrived at them? Chair Eklund. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm pulling open that section of the bill right now. But if, if my memory serves, when uh, Representative Lizgard presented this bill in committee, the uh, requirements were that the contractors that work at the refineries have um, a approved apprenticeship program so that the people working in these refineries in and around these communities, we know are trained and, and working safely on the job. Uh, Representative Garofalo, I mean, I'm sorry, Representative Nash. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Madam Chair. And just wanted to point out that uh, the way you're building that requirement um, basically makes it only for union laborers. And to the exclusion of people from the industry um, that have 25, 30 years of experience, but hold no union card. Is that correct? Chair sure, Eklund. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Nash. I, I, I don't believe that's correct. It, it, might, uh, it might lean that way because our union trades have uh, excellent, outstanding apprenticeship programs going on. But this is more for safety, especially when our uh, refineries are located so close to communities. We want to make sure that we have a talented and uh, a talented workforce and a trained workforce that is working on these projects. Representative Nash. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Representative Eklund, um, I know people who have worked in refineries that um, aren't union members that have exemplary safety records. And, you know, if you want to be nepotistic in your bill and say that you have to join a union, um, I guess that's your purview, but uh, Representative Garofalo's point of a few minutes ago, this stands zero chance of being passed into law. And I think is quite discriminatory in a time where we're trying to put people back to work. If you have a qualified person with years and years and years of experience um, to preclude them from being able to work simply because they choose not to join a union seems quite heavy handed and thuggish. Thank you. Mm. Okay, do we have any further questions? Uh, Representative Garofalo. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just to be clear, we're laying over uh, 1670 right now, correct? Yes, we are. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, any further questions? Well, I want to thank Chair Eckland for his work on creating greater financial security and workplace safety for Minnesota workers. Um, and I would like to um, offer Chair Eckland last words. Thank you, Madam Chair members. This uh, House File 1670 looks to help thousands of Minnesotan workers, workers who have been de devastated by COVID-19. It looks to take care of those who have lost their jobs because of the pandemic and to protect relief provide relief to workers forced to choose between a paycheck and taking care of a seriously ill family member. This good legislation will help take care and maintain our workforce coming out of this pandemic and make sure the measures are in place for the future that I ask for your support. So there being no further discussion, the chair will lay over House File 167 as amended. Thank you, Chair Eklund. So our uh, next bill is House File 1342, which is the Workforce and Business Development Budget Bill. Chair Noor, would you like to move your bill um, to be recommended for placement on the General Register and tell us about your budget? And then we will come back to the amendment after your presentation. Chair Noor. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. That is my motion. Okay, um, so uh, would you like to explain your bill? Yes, Madam Chair, if I may share a little bit of a slide to allow uh, understanding of the bill. Um, so Madam Chair and members, we all understand the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, quite frankly, we have seen uh, the devastation of COVID-19 pandemic for workforce and also for the businesses. This is not a moment for us to step back. We need to help businesses. So in this bill, House File 1342, we prioritize small businesses that have been impacted significantly by the COVID-19 pandemic. We're putting a 50 million for immediate relief for small businesses as an emergency grant. And we're giving a 50% to the greater Minnesota, 50% for, for the metro areas. This will be administered through the Minnesota Foundation, Initiative Foundations and also DEED as a grant. We also have uh, requirements in that. They, it has to be for employers with less than 100 uh, employees. They have to de demonstrate financial hardship as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're also looking at a minimum of 5,000 to 100,000 in this grant. So this is an immediate uh, grant and we're setting aside 10 million out of the total uh, based on the numbers for smaller business with less than six employees and another 10 million for uh, minority businesses, which also includes a 3 million on top of that. For the rest of the bill, Madam Chair and members uh, to go through the 2022-23 uh, budget, you can see we're using uh, general funds, remediation funds, uh, workforce development funds and paid family medical leave fund. In total, what we're trying to do when it comes to the businesses, I will highlight a few sections, uh, especially the small business development centers, uh, which we have throughout the region. They provide a significant support for businesses that have been impacted by COVID-19. There's an additional 500,000 to their budget. We also have a small business support of a $3 million for those who are underserved, uh, financially and economically, uh, you know, who are facing hardships, we're providing that additional support. And in this bill, we're making a significant investment in childcare business development. Let me put it this way. This is one of the uh, highest amount that we're putting forward to support businesses in childcare who are in underserved areas, where we're putting a priority because many of the employers have told us that they need childcare for them to succeed. And this amount, more than five, $7 million in this bill, goes to Greater Minnesota to support the childcare business development. Not the programming, but more on the business development so that we can allow many women who have been left out, including during this COVID-19, 
We also have Launch Minnesota, which is a unique program that provides uh, technology innovation, which I call them the basement innovators who are given the chance to succeed. We also have the community business development for uh, close to uh, $2.3 million to support the businesses as a grant program. And also we established a micro enterprise, a new program for those who are making less than 80% area median income to be supported uh, through the state uh, business development. We also moved the labor market in, uh, information to this uh, bucket so that we can provide real time statistics on what's happening on the ground. Uh, Madam Chair, we are making a significant change to the Workforce Development Fund. We are staying within the framework of the intention for the Workforce Development Fund. As you can see from this slide, uh, the, the total receipt on this program will be divided into uh, four sections. The first one is up to 65%, goes to three competitive grant program, which includes uh, eliminating employment barriers, we're creating a new innovative uh, grant solutions. We're also establishing a review council whereby the community will be involved. Those who are sitting in that council will be able to make the determination based on the need and that grant will be available within the deed framework. And we're also putting 30% in the dislocated worker program, 5% goes to the Minnesota Job uh, Partnership to allow those who are struggling the most to receive the assistance. With that, if there's any balance, it goes back to the competitive program grants. That's how we have divided the new realignment. We have resisted the appropriation, direct appropriation from the Workforce Development Fund. And some of the highlight in the employment and training uh, is based on what has already existed. I will highlight the nonprofit uh, Propel uh, Minnesota, which supports uh, uh, small uh, underserved organizations by providing them with the tools that they need. We also codify Paths to Prosperity, which is a, a great program that provides a significant help for employers to seek skilled employees who are able to do the work that they need. So this is a partnership between the, uh, the workers and the employers so that we can help them succeed and have opportunity to succeed in life. Um, Madam Chair, if I go down, I will say there's a general support services. There's also the Minnesota Trade Office funding appropriation. And we also have the vocational rehabilitation services, which provide services to individuals who are disabled, provide services to the mentally ill uh, so that they can be able to participate in the workforce. The last but not the least in this bucket is the state uh, services for the blind. We're making a small change to allow also to receive uh, donations to this account. The other pieces in this program is the paid family medical leave. We all know the impact of COVID-19. In fact, more than 250 employers are now asking the federal government that we implement a paid family medical leave. This will allow people to replace their wages based on a leave for paternity or maternity leave, for bonding with their kid when they have a newborn baby, for serious illness for themselves or a family member. It also provides an opportunity for those who are seeking to stay working because they don't have to choose between a paycheck and taking care of their loved ones or themselves. Uh, Madam Chair members, uh, the funding comes from general funds for $10.8 million so that we can create the program through the Department of Employment and Economic uh, Development. This is a unique program. It's based on what is what we have right now. The UI benefit program is a, a, is a great program. So we're using that model to develop the paid medical leave. And we also have few uh, requirements that we meet uh, due to the changes that will be implemented in the bill. Uh, Madam Chair and members, we also have changes that are due to the unemployment. We have seen how significantly that has impacted our economy. We're putting forward economic security that works for all. Uh, we are codifying the executive orders and sunsetting based on the federal timeline, which is September 4, 2021. 
We also have the school hourly employees who have been left out depending on who they work for. So we want to make sure that there is a program that they can rely on. And some of them, quite frankly, had to go through hoops so that they can receive the benefits. We are also taking care of the high school students who have been left out from the UI program. Uh, we are also extending the appeal timeline from 20 to 60 days for both the workers and also the employers. We're also putting an end to the social security offset, whereby we're one of the only states that allows that to continue, whereby if you're receiving social security, that will impact the payments that we receive from the UI benefits. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, uh, that's the end of my presentation. And I just wanted to highlight that this is a great pro uh, bill which was developed with the labor of love to make sure that we take care of those who are facing significant economic security in our state. So I'll take any questions before I move the amendment or we can move the amendment at this point. Yeah, so thank you, Chair Noor. Um, I would like um, um, if we can move your A16 office amendment now and maybe you can explain that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to move the A16 amendment. Uh, the A16 amendment is just a technical uh, uh, amendment. Uh, there was a transposed number in the bill that we wanted to fix. And also, we're changing the 11,000 for the technology update for LCC to the house so that we are aligned with the paid family medical leave. Uh, that's all in the, uh, the technical amendment that we have. Members, are there any questions on the amendment? If not, Chair Norris renew his motion to adopt the A16 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Representative Garofalo, do you wish to offer the A15 amendment? Um, I do, Madam Chair. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, and Madam Chair. Before I introduce the, uh, this amendment, uh, Rep uh, Representative Noor, can you again just briefly cover how you're approaching the Workforce Development Fund? Uh, there are substantial changes that you are addressing here. Uh, one of which I think the unintended side effect is is that you're um, turning over just even. <laughs> It's a broken record, but you're turning over even more authority to the governor to appropriate funds. Can you elaborate on what you're doing there? Chair Noor? Uh, Representative Graffalo, we are not uh, turning over anything to the governor. Uh, in fact, uh, these programs have existed before. What has been happening is we have been dipping into that fund to find not only for workforce development, but also uh, business development. So our intent, we resisted the uh, use of that fund. In fact, we have put $60 million request from organizations who are doing an amazing job. In fact, because of that challenge, we created a realignment process that meets the needs for Minnesotans. And the competitive grant is going to allow organizations that have been left out to participate in the process because there will be a significant amount of resources. The dislocated work uh, what the program for the state will receive their portion for up to 30%, which is close to the amount they've been using over the years. So this is not a significant change other than putting a realignment to make sure that we take care of those who need the most. Otherwise, we can spend this entire fund and continue to see the challenges that we face with so many people who are unemployed right now due to the, uh, the uh, pandemic. And quite frankly, uh, the, this is a unique program for the state of Minnesota. We have a federal dislocated worker program through the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. And many of the states don't have similar programs that we do. So we, we are in, in a place that we can shape the future for those who are struggling today. Um, but so, Madam uh, Chair and uh, Representative Noor, I, I appreciate the way that you are uh, you are describing it, but uh, what you're doing is you're taking a process by which the legislature is able to weigh in and identify specific items that are priorities, and you're turning those over to non-legislators. Is, is that a fair way to describe it? Uh, Chair Noor. Representative Graffel, I, I think if you read the bill, 
into the details of how we have set it up. We are targeting those who need the most. And by doing a direct appropriation, there'll be nothing left in that bucket. And we will end up being the same place that we don't want to be every single year. Particularly with the, uh, with the council that we created, we'll make sure that the funding continues. If you look at the way that the program is done right now, we don't have a control. When we set the dislocated worker program, the boards that exist will be using that funding without any legislative uh, involvement. That's why we made sure that we do put some guardrails to support workers who are struggling today. Right, but oh, Madam yeah. Chair yeah, and Representative well. Noor, um, so first of all, I have read your bill, um, so I don't need to be told to read the bill. Uh, second of all, uh, what I'm highlighting here is that the, appro the, the costs of your bill are paid for with a higher target, a, a higher target that's not gonna take place. Uh, the Senate will be, as they usually do, we're taking an aggressive view of appropriating from the Workforce Development Fund. And what, regardless of how that shakes out, the net effect of your bill is that you are turning over appropriations authority to a non-legislative entity. Now, I don't know if that's your intent or if that's an accident, but that is what you are, you are doing, is you are taking the legislature, receding from the process, and then empowering other people outside the legislature to make decisions. Is that your intended effect or not? Chair Noor. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Raffalon, no. Um, if you have gone through that bill, you will see that we're putting 65% of the Workforce Development Fund in competitive uh, grant, especially in three buckets. Some of those programs have pre-existed, meaning uh, P2P, which is a uh, pathway to prosperity program. We know its impact. We are creating a unique program that eliminates employment barriers. We legislators cannot do that work. In fact, if we start uh, dipping deep into that fund, we end up creating more unemployment. So we are designating that funding to address the significant barriers in employment. At the same time, we're creating a unique program which is innovative whereby we're telling organizations or entities who can bring innovation by telling them we'll do pay for performance. When you show us what you will deliver, based on that result, you will receive your funding. So this is unique because we're encouraging people to become more innovative, to spend their own resources before they even take a dip into the appropriation. So this, this is a great way of addressing the significant employment barriers that we face. I don't know if you saw the last week's uh, release of the labor uh, statistics. Uh, while so many individuals are doing great in terms of the economy, there are so many individuals who have been left out especially for BIPOC individuals and women who are struggling with the unemployment rate in this state and also throughout the country. Well, um, Madam, Madam Chair, I, I will say that the author has a unique way of answering questions that I'm not asking. <laughs> it's a creative way of uh, coming up with uh, saying the same words over and over that are not answering my question, but I don't, I don't think me asking it a third or fourth time is going to highlight that issue, but um, moving on, uh, Representative Noor, can you um, uh, elaborate on what the costs are to the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund in this bill? Chair Noor. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. It's, it's, there's no cost. This is already existing program that funds workforce development. So as I stated, it's a unique program that many states don't have. So this is automatically deposited into that workforce development fund. All we're doing is making sure that we prioritize those who need the most. Madam Chair, Raffle. Representative Noor, I didn't say the Workforce Development Fund, I said the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. What are the costs yeah. to the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund? Representative Noor. Chair Noor. Madam, Chair, Madam Chair, as I stated, this does not have any impact because it's attached to the Unemployment Workforce Fund. It's existing uh, process. This is funded through the uh, Unemployment Trust Fund directly. It's a portion of that is attached to this. Uh, so it funds the Workforce Development Fund. If you saw the slide, it's 0.1% uh, of that taxable wage goes into the Workforce Development Fund. 
Representative Madam Chair, Representative Noor, I'm not talking about the Workforce Development Fund. That's not what I'm bringing up. I'm talking about the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. There's changes in your bill that change the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. I'm familiar with the Workforce Development Fund. The Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund, what is the cost to that fund? Uh, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Prince Graffel. So I was assuming you're still asking what was the uh, cost because of the changes we're making. Yes, there is a, a cost uh, that will be associated with the changes that we're making because of the exclusion. We're excluding individuals who are paying into the trust fund. If high school students are allowed to participate in the workforce, then they should be eligible based on the criteria established for the unemployment benefit. But right now we are excluding them based on 1939 law, which prohibits the payment to students. In fact, uh, if you are following throughout that process, uh, the Court of Appeals had determined that the students were eligible because we even denied them the pandemic and employment uh, benefits, which they are now receiving. So we have to take the appropriate action to support young individuals, not only that they are dependent on that resources, some of them, their families are dependent on the unemployment benefit that they could have received. Representative Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Representative Noor, what is the cost? If you look at this spreadsheet, uh, we do have uh, $40 million uh, in the workforce uh, trust fund impact for that. So with, if you look through that process, you will see that impact included in the spreadsheet. Okay, Representative Noor, this is the third time you keep representing, you, you keep talking about the workforce fund. I'm not talking about the workforce fund. I'm talking about the unemployment insurance trust fund. C correct. And Madam Chair? Uh, Chair Noor. As I stated, the unemployment trust fund impact because of the changes we're making, if you look at the spreadsheet, there's $40 million impact. Okay, and thank you. And Madam Chair and Representative, Representative Noor, the unemployment insurance trust fund currently has a deficit of 1.3 billion, is that correct? Chair Noor. Madam Chair, I represent Graffel, that is correct. Okay, Representative and Representative Noor, um, how this extra 41, I show 41.7 million. How is that going to be paid for? Is that just going to be added to the deficit? Chair Noor. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, as I stated, uh, we are excluding individuals who are paying into that trust fund today. By excluding them, we're not doing uh, favors for anybody. In fact, this is a way of ensuring that we do have fairness in the system, uh, that we're able to support the students then they should not be paying into the trust fund if we want to exclude them. Uh, and also for the, uh, the social security offset, we know that for many individuals who are relying on receiving a UI benefit, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, should not be excluded just because simply we decided not to provide that assistance. And we are one of the only states in the country who are excluding individuals receiving social security benefits. With that, I think this will add up to the, uh, what we see right now, but we will wait until August when the benefits for the pandemic and employment ends. With this, the, the, uh, the balance that we have right now, that is at 0% from the federal government. There's no interest paid into that. And I'm hopeful because the, this, the uniqueness of the unemployment benefit is when we do have an economic boom, that funding will grow. When we do have hardships, economic hardships, that's when we utilize the program. That's how it was designed to work, and it's working as it was designed at this moment. Um, Madam, okay, Madam so, Chair. Uh, 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 one moment. So, um, for the purpose of the, the now, Representative Garofalo, um, I, I did call on you to offer your A15 amendment. And at this moment, I, I would like for us to move that A15 uh, amendment. And we can come back to the questioning once okay, we I can, do that. I can do that, but Madam Chair, I have a concern. I like Representative Noor. Uh, I get along with them well, but I am starting to think that perhaps I have a some sort of strange filter on my computer today 
so that the questions I'm asking, the words are being translated into different words and sent to Representative Miller's computer. And then he is responding by answering different questions that I'm not asking. I, re I like Representative Miller, okay? But just good Lord, just answer my question when I ask it. If you don't know the answer, defer to staff. I just wanted to know if that money in the UI trust fund, if that's being added to the deficit, who's gonna pay for it? I don't need to hear about the, the benefits of the advocacy for it, but Madam Chair, we'll, uh, we'll come back to that later and uh, we'll okay. discuss that. So Madam Chair, you want, uh, at this time, you want me to move the A15? Yes. Correct? Yeah. Okay, so Madam Chair, I will, uh, I will move the A15 amendment. And Madam Chair, the reason why I brought up the Workforce Development Fund is that uh, the reason why is that, you know, this amendment would be to fund funded through the Workforce Development Fund. I think we are all aware of the enormous pressure that is being is taking place in our hospitality industry right now, uh, specifically with small businesses that the chains, uh, the big business chains, they're doing just fine, right? They're, they're doing, they uh, just like uh, big government and big business have never been more flush. They got more money laying around. Um, but what this is, is just a $250,000 grant. Uh, what it, that, and it's been, um, and what it does is it just gives uh, uh, schools a $5,000 grant so they can get local chefs, local school officials, uh, and kids involved and exposed to culinary careers. So whether that's in school kitchens, local restaurants, um, this is something that is, um, it's very popular in our communities. It takes a collaborative approach. Uh, this is based off of Representative Baker's uh, House File 1324. It's got strong bipartisan support. And um, there really is, I mean, given the, the distress that we're having in our hospitality industry, this is something that we should, uh, we should be doing. Um, the, the author mentioned that there's no earmarks this year in the bill, um, and that's just not true. That's uh, not accurate. But this is something that has strong bipartisan support that is helping out an industry that has just been devastated by government action. And so I would ask for member support of the, uh, the A15 amendment, and I would ask for a roll call on it. Chair Noor, would you like to comment on the amendment? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Graffalo, just first of all, I do have an en encoder on my computer, which translates uh, what you know, I'm viewing right now, because that's how <laughs> my translation system works in, in the computer process here. Uh, uh, it, it's true, I do have an encoder which takes the video and puts everything forward. Uh, for the amendment, uh, I think I spoke clearly about how we have realigned the workforce development, especially for the training purposes, ensuring that there is a clear transparency and accountability. Uh, for that reason, I think we declined to accept any appropriation. In fact, as a Democrat, as you've stated, we want to use all the funding. Uh, we are resisting. We're putting a resistance and restraint in, in process so that we can allow those who really need the most receive the funding. In fact, uh, Prostat may even receive more funding than the amount that you're asking for. With even the federal program, we know that highlights, it highlights the need for state and also local governments to fund hospitality industry. I can assure you they will qu qualify for the program the way it's set up. In fact, I will be making uh, calls to, to many of my friends to ensure that we allow them to continue to receive help for, so that we can rebound from this COVID-19 pandemic. With that, I will ask uh, to vote no on this amendment and we'll, we'll continue to have conversation in how we can assist the hospitality industry so that they can get back to normalcy and even better. All right, members, is there any, Representative um, Garofalo or members, are there any further discussion to the amendment? So Representative Garofalo renews his motion to adopt the A15 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Madam Chair, uh, roll call was requested. A roll call? Well, um, Ms. Bartman, please take the roll. Chair Moran? No. Moran, no. Vice Chair Olson? No. Olson, no. Representative Garofalo? Yes. Garofalo, aye. Representative Albright, excused. Representative Becker Finn? No. Becker Finn, no. Representative Bernardi? No. Bernardi, no. 
Representative Eklund? No. Eklund, no. Representative Hansen? No. Hansen, no. Representative Hassan? Representative Hassan? Representative Hertos? Yes. Hertos, aye. Representative Hornstein? No. Hornstein, no. Representative Johnson? Yes. Johnson, aye. Representative Kresha? Kresha, aye. Kresha, aye. Representative Liebling? No. Liebling, no. Representative Lilly? Lilly, no. Lilly, no. Representative Mariani, excused. Representative Marquart? Marquart, no. Marquart, no. Representative Miller? Miller, yes. Miller, aye. Representative Nash? Nash, aye. Nash, aye. Representative Nelson? Nelson, no. Nelson, no. <clears throat> Representative Noor? Noor, no. Noor, no. Representative O'Neill? O'Neill, aye. O'Neill, aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, no. Pulowski, no. Representative Petersburg, excused. Representative Pinto? No. Pinto, no. Representative Schumacher, excused. Representative Schultz? Schultz, no. Schultz, no. Representative Scott? Aye. Scott, aye. Representative Sundin? No. Sundin, no. Representative Hassan? Eight ayes and 16 nays. There have been eight ayes and 16 nays. The motion does not prevail. To the bill. Uh, I see we have a few persons who have questions on the bill. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Representative Knorr, um, I'm just wondering if you could outline in the bill what you're doing to help get our small businesses um, up and running again um, to help them. Uh, I know there's 50 million in here for, for some grants, but I don't know how far that's gonna go. And so I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on, on what's in this bill that are gonna help our small businesses. Because it seems like what's happening here is they're just getting um, doubled down upon um, by your party. And I just, I have great concerns about that. So if you could elaborate, that would be helpful to me. Chair Noor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Scott, uh, as I stated, uh, this is the first step that we're doing is we're doing that immediate relief. Uh, we've done that before, uh, including the December special session uh, in the prior session that we did. Uh, making sure that we support small businesses that have been impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. And if you look through the process when I mentioned that we're increasing the technical assistance for businesses to start applying for some of the federal grant programs uh, by encouraging the SBDCs to provide more assistance. As you're aware of, uh, we have a great program that is going to be funded through the federal program, which is called restaurant revitalization program. Uh, we will also have an opportunity to have community navigators to help small businesses that have been impacted so that they can apply for the federal funds. Uh, and as you're aware of, there's uh, a portion for the PPP program and some of that. Those are federal programs, but through technical assistance, we are helping small businesses take advantage of, of that program. So our bill reflects our priorities to support small business that have been hit hard by the COVID-19. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I appreciate your explanation there. Um, I, I just, I see, you know, to me, um, this bill is out of balance. Um, you're doing a lot for the employees, but you're doing disproportionately a less amount for the employers who are struggling. Um, and of course, um, not only in the previous bill are you doubling down on the pain that you're causing them by these mandates of paid leave 
and, and other issues that were in that bill, you just keep lowering the hammer, hammer on these small businesses. And one of the best things that we can do to help these folks is forgiveness of the PPP loans, which your caucus refuses to do. And I, I just, I, I know your, maybe your intentions are, are well-placed, but it seems, and, and even in this very practical amendment that Representative Garofalo brought to help out the hospitality industry, I mean, those folks have been devastated. Hotels, motels, restaurants, uh, event centers. Um, this very practical amendment that was brought by Representative Garofalo, and you refused to take it. So I just, I am very disappointed. I don't serve on this committee. Um, but I'm just very disappointed about the imbalance in this um, in this bill um, of not helping the small businesses that have been so devastated by um, the shutdowns um, related to COVID-19. And I will end my comments there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really don't know where to start. I. You know, I served on the Unemployment Insurance Advisory Council for quite some time. I carried the unemployment insurance bills. Um, I know the staff there and they, they are excellent. I know that they are completely underwater and they can't even come up with an accurate number as to the impact of your bill, Representative Noor. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't even know where to start. It, it probably is not 41 million, uh, you know, in all honesty, and you know that as well because they are completely and utterly overwhelmed with the work that they're trying to do. And they just frankly don't have time to calculate the cost of your bill, Representative Noor. Um, I just had a long conversation with the chair in the Senate this morning about this bill, the impact of this bill. And he and I started calculating many of these things. In fact, um, Representative Noor, the, if, I don't know if you've even looked at this, but the amount of money that the trust fund pays out, if you look at the past decade, starting in 2010, um, that year it was $1.3 billion paid out in unemployment insurance benefits. Now it tailed off until we hit this crisis. And just before this crisis hit, it was $784 million paid out. And right now, just as Representative Garofalo said, it's $1.3 billion in the hole. I don't know if you fully understand the impact of that on businesses. They are already suffering. And those that pay into this, some of them are on the edge, on the absolute edge of collapse and closure and bankruptcy. I have, and then you talk about all the heavy handedness that the administration has brought upon them. Um, I won't even go into that because it's not relevant to this bill, but Representative Noor, you know, it's, it kind of is frustrating to me, honestly. I mean, I like you too, but Representative Noor, Representative Groffle had to ask you questions multiple times. And I don't, I don't know what was going on there, but I could have answered those in just mere seconds. And I don't even serve on that committee anymore. I did for many years. In fact, I served under Representative Garofalo. But Representative Noor, my question after all of that, not, like I didn't need your answer because I already knew the answer, but my question to you and to Representative Eklund once we combine these bills, are have you done an analysis of how many businesses are going to close if this actually became law, which I thank God it probably is not, I know the Senate is not interested in nearly any of these provisions between the two bills, but Representative Noor, do you understand the intense impact on small businesses that you are putting, you are literally putting them out of business between this bill and even worse, Representative Eklund's bill that we just heard. I want to know, have the two of you sat down and done an analysis of how many businesses you are going to put out of business and how many business owners are going to be bankrupt if this actually became law? Representative Noor. Chair yeah, Noor. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative O'Neill. Uh, we understand uh, the struggles of small businesses. 
And as someone who has been supporting uh, small businesses so that they can not only recover, but also to thrive, we understand those challenges. If you are referencing the unemployment benefit, those challenges exist. That was the purpose for the, uh, the program that was created. Fortunately, the federal program has been giving us on a 0% interest, so we don't pay any federal interest. The program based on the focus, it's going to replenish itself. In fact, at the beginning of this session, we did not. We held employers harmless so that there is no increase uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and employment. So we understand that. That was the reason why we did it at the beginning of the year. So we understand that, that there is a $1.3 billion deficit in that fund. We understand it's going to be resolved through the normal process that has existed uh, before. So with the other programs that you're referring to, the paid family medical leave uh, for the safe and sick time, uh, we understand that the impact of COVID-19 in fact, for the paid and family medical leave for a cup of coffee, $3 a week, you can provide assistance to those who need it. Many small businesses don't afford a workplace benefits to their employees. So this is more about economic security. It's about ensuring people don't choose between a paycheck and going back to work. In fact, many of the employers will favor the program because it creates a a good program that they can rely on, that it's portable. When you live from one employment to the other, you can still continue to utilize. That's how systems should work. We are one of the only few countries that doesn't have a nationwide uh, workplace benefit like this one. In fact, we should have done it a long time ago. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, again, Representative Noor, you could have just said, no, we didn't analyze it. I'm just so disappointed this morning. I asked if you and Representative Eklund, who are putting this bill together that have heavy handed harmful policies to small business owners, if you have done the calculation or if you've had any of the agencies do a calculation as to how many businesses you expect to go under. They are literally hanging on by a thread. We have lost nearly 40% of our hospitality industry. According to them, how many more are we going to lose if we actually enacted these policies into place? Because that's who you're hurting. You're hurting the ones that can't afford to do this benefit now. They are going to go under. And I'm asking you again for the second time, have you and Representative Eklund gotten together and looked at this bill as a whole and what the fiscal impact will be on small businesses and thereby how many of them will close? You didn't answer that question. And I'm guessing that you're not gonna answer it if I ask it a second time. So I will just leave it at that, that this is a heavy handed approach to small businesses. If they could afford to do these things, they would already be doing these things because guess what? If they can offer those things, they are a marketing draw for new employees. And I can tell you this, there are, there's businesses after businesses after businesses after businesses that are desperate for new employees and they can't find them. And maybe because some of them are still on unemployment are not interested in coming back to work. I have heard anecdotal stories all over the board about that. That's a, a comment and a concern for another day, but I'm not even gonna ask the question because I don't think you're gonna answer it this time either. Uh, and I'm disappointed that, I'm disappointed in the conversation this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so <clears throat> it is 10.08. We need to take a vote by 10.30 to go to the House floor. Um, representative, and, and so we're gonna do our best to answer, to ask a question and allow the chair to respond and there may not be the way that you want to hear it, but it's his, it's his response and his answer. And we're not gonna keep going over the same question. Let's try not to do that. Let's try to be efficient with the last um, 20 minutes that we have. Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, Representative Noor. Um, for your presentation, you caught my attention when you were talking about expanding the uh, provisions or expansion of benefits to high school students who primarily are in school and uh, trying to 
get an education so that they can become gainfully employed. But um, as you know, the fund was uh, considered quite liquid just pre-COVID. And uh, now we're 1.3 billion in the hole. We've had a reversal in cash position in that fund of the UI Trust Fund of nearly 3 billion, if not more. Uh, I'd like to correct you in that uh, there's no interest on the federal government uh, debt that we owed and in borrowing. That's true right now, but that has not been the position of the federal government, and we do pay interest. Uh, and it will eventually uh, kick in again where we will be accumulating interest on that. But to the point about the expansion of benefits to high school students, Representative Noor, uh, you made reference <clears throat> to the uh, payroll contributions that they're making. Do you have a, a cost uh, of what this expanded benefit is going to cost in terms of anticipated claims for high school students uh, and what their contributions are? Uh, is that a a net zero, or what are, what are we talking about here? Yeah, Noah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Hatos. I think the analysis that we've given from the department shows uh, $41 million for the unemployment. And if you go through that process, in fact, some of the other uh, pieces uh, showed a zero, uh, zero. For example, changing the unemployment uh, issues that I think will have led to more. Uh, it's almost zero for the students. As I stated earlier, if they're old enough to be employed, they should be old enough to receive an employment benefit. A 1939 law that excluded them should not prohibit the students from receiving. So uh, I don't know exactly how much they're bringing in and how much we are going to be giving them in total. I don't know if it's going to be balanced based on that analysis because this is an insurance program that is funded ongoing by all employers through the uh, tax, uh, taxable wages for the employees. Representative Hotas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, uh, thanks for your explanation. It sounds like maybe you do understand the uh, program a little bit better than the way you presented it because you made a nexus that the uh, students are paying into this fund and that they're entitled to these benefits because of the payroll contributions that they're making. But the truth of the matter is, there is not a single employee anywhere in the state of Minnesota that has a payroll deduction for unemployment insurance compensation. That is borne solely by the employer. Not any dollars are paid by the employee. And at a time when as we've heard uh, previous comments about how small businesses are struggling, we know that the rate is going to increase to make this fund solvent, to repay the deficit that we have borrowed from the federal government, and then to further expand the benefits at this time is really quite unwise. Uh, the smallest businesses, those who are left uh, after the dust settles, who are fortunate enough to, to survive the 2022 are going to be faced with pretty significant payroll tax increases in the area of unemployment compensation. And if your bill were adopted as proposed in the merging of these other benefits is basically a job killer. Uh, when you increase costs to employ people, it's either going to result in decreased benefits to people or it's going to result in fewer jobs. And we've already seen around the country and even internationally, as I've traveled overseas uh, several years ago, I saw the innovations of, of our, our companies based here in the United States, McDonald's in particular in Germany uh, has eliminated most of the counter help. And you just simply use an iPad to place your orders. It, you know, there are ways that businesses will have to become more efficient in order to survive. And one of the ways to do that is to automate and to do more on yourself. So whether it's bagging your own groceries or doing your own self checkout at Walmart or at Home Depot, uh, these are the innovations that are leading companies to take the actions that are necessary to remain profitable and stay in business. And that is getting rid of unnecessary jobs. So that's an unfortunate consequence. and. This is just a bad idea to be expanding 
uh, the idea that uh, students who are in school should be entitled to, to uh, unemployment benefits. They're not in the workforce full time. And uh, there's a reason why they're not included. And the cost of it is one of the reasons. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative becker -Fan. Chair I becker -Fan. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, we have a long week still ahead of us in this committee. Uh, and I just, um, I've also been uh, a bit disappointed in this debate this morning, but uh, my my disappointment has been about the the amount of focus that's been on uh, Chair Noor and not the measure before us. Um, as we, we all should know um, by this point, uh, you know, our rules, uh, the, the question before us is whether we support the policy that's that's in the bill. And I like Chair Noor too, um, but it's actually irrelevant uh, to our debate here. Um, uh, and I respect Chair Noor and the work that he's done uh, to bring this bill forward. And so I just uh, wanted to, to point that out um, and hope that members will, on uh, that all of us uh, remember as the debate moves forward and as we hear more bills this week that, um, you know, the question before us is whether we support the policy that's in the bill. It is not about um, the motives or intentions or how we feel about a certain member or chair of a committee, but um, whether we think it's good policy or not. Um, and then it's on us to choose whether whether to support it and to vote accordingly. So uh, thank you, Chair Noor, uh, for, uh, for your, your words today. Thanks. Okay, Chair, um, I'm sorry, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I'll... Uh, I guess I, I won't compliment Representative Noor on my friendship with him, uh, uh, nor will I compliment him. I do want to say the slideshow you put together, Representative Noor, uh, where you went through it, I hope that's something that other members will copy in the future and use. But don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't like the substance of your bill, but the way you laid out the slideshow and went through it, um, that was very impressive. I don't know if you or staff did that, but I would hope that um, the DFL majority should look at that as a model for presenting bills in the future. But uh, following Representative Becker Finn's advice uh, on the substance of your bill, um, uh, your bill sucks, uh, and I'm totally opposed to it. So maybe, maybe that'll make her feel better as I describe it that way. Um, so Representative Noor, I think uh, two items I'd like to um, uh, mention here, and then we can go on and get a vote done before 1030. Um, the federal assistance we're getting, we're getting over two and a half billion dollars from the federal government. And the guidance they've given us is tailor-made for your committee in terms of helping small businesses, improving economic recovery, stopping the centralization of commerce that is going to large businesses at the expense of small businesses. Why aren't you using or at least proposing uh, in a conditional appropriation the use of any of those federal funds? Chair Noor. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair and Representative Raffo. Uh, the, the question before us is, do we have the guidance in how we will be using? Do we have the budget resolution to use the, the, uh, that fund? No. So we could not use the federal funds uh, that is coming to the state. I'm glad that you mentioned it's going to be supporting significantly uh, businesses, especially hospitality industry as it has been defined. We're waiting for more guidance and I can assure you that as a state we'll be advocating for more support for small businesses so that they can thrive. Well, Madam Chair and Representative Noor, when you say That's the like state, Rafa. when you say the state, um, that means Governor Tim Walls. And a reminder to you and the members of the DFL majority that once again, you do not work for Tim Walls. You vote, you work for the people of the district you represent and the acknowledgement of this $2.7 billion that the legislature is gonna have zero role in appropriating. It's a, com it's a complete ignorance of the responsibilities we have. But um, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that we get done by 1030, but uh, I do want members of the committee to realize that right now, okay, the effects of these government shut, the, the government shutdown on the private sector uh, the restrictions because of COVID, this has resulted in an unprecedented consolidation of commerce and business to big business, to large corporations. And this has been done at the expense of small businesses, family-owned businesses, independent operators, 
that who is, that is who is bearing the brunt of this economic destruction from COVID is that these policies, which have been supported by Governor Walls and the DFL, are pushing more and more business to Amazon, Walmart, Target, and the main street businesses are the ones taking it in the shorts. And so at a time where we have unprecedented resources in the hands of the state government, as a result of the federal stimulus package, as a result of a $1.5 billion budget surplus, at a time when the state of Minnesota has $2 billion sitting in the bank, the priority of this committee, the priority of the DFL has been to defend the large businesses in this greater, larger market share by not assisting the small businesses that are at hand, the individual, the individual proprietors, the family owned businesses. They don't have the large cash stockpiles that corporate chains have to stay open. Target, Walmart, Amazon, they've never been worth more money than they are right now, never. They've never been sitting on this much cash or had higher share values than they do at this exact moment. And the response of the DFL in Minnesota, in order to, at a time when they should be helping these small businesses get back, get back on their feet and regain the market share they lost as a result of the COVID restrictions that were imposed on them, but not on big business, the response to them is to be a do nothing majority, a do nothing DFL. For those reasons and many others, I don't know how any member of the Republican side of the aisle can possibly support this bill. I'll be voting no. I can only hope that some reasonableness is, is attached to these bills when they go through the conference committee process. But I remain very, very pessimistic about that because it appears where we are heading is another leadership tribunal where three members are gonna decide everything and things will be obeyed. So I'm gonna vote no on this and ask members to do the same. Okay, with there being no further discussion on this bill, I see no other questions. I, I really do wanna uh, thank uh, Chair Noor for his work in creating more of an economic opportunity for Minnesota's workforce and businesses. You know, you, I like you, Noor, and I like you, and I know just how smart, how dedicated you are how hard you've worked to make sure that we are investing in small businesses, especially those who have 100 employees of less, you know, the challenges that they have gone through over this last year through this pandemic. So I want to thank you for your dedication as chair of the Workforce and Economic Committee. Um, and so with that, I would like to just uh, allow you to have the last words. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members. Uh, this is, I, as I stated at the beginning, this is a labor of love to ensure that we support small businesses that are struggling. Uh, in fact, our bill reflects that. All the support that we've done previously, uh, it also includes support for workers. We cannot ignore uh, the workforce of the state of Minnesota and have a thriving economic uh, uh, reality. So with also knowing that the K-shaped recovery has not helped the small businesses. It has helped, as Representative Ruffalo stated, the big businesses. We want big business, we want small businesses because small business are the economic engine for our state. Our workforce depend on us. This is a moment that we can step up and provide them workplace benefit that they can rely on. I know we can do that. In fact, with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we have learned a lot. And this is an opportunity for us to do the right thing. Madam Chair, I will be asking for members to support this great bill that is before us. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Noah. There being no further discussion, we will proceed to our series of motions to combine these two bills and send them to the floor. Chair Eklund, would you like to move uh, your language contained in House File 1670 as amended, be incorporated into the Jobs and Economic Development Omnibus Bill as separate articles? That is my motion, Madam Chair. So the motion is before us, and this will be a voice vote. Does everyone understand the motion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? No. no. The motion prevails. Chair Noor, do you move that the language of House File 1342 as amended be incorporated into the Jobs and Economic um, Development Omnibus as separate articles. 
Yes, Madam Chair. So the motion is before us. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. No. 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 The motion prevails. With that, Chair that, Norris. That, 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 okay, it's the okay, echo there. And it's not me. With that, Chair Norris renews his motion that House File 1342, as amended, be recommended for placement on the general register and that nonpartisan staff be directed to make any technical corrections and amend the title. Ms. Sparkman, please take the roll. Chair Moran? Aye. Moran, aye. Vice Chair Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo? No. Garofalo, no. Representative Albright, excused. Representative Becker Finn? Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Eklund? Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hansen? Representative Hansen? Representative Hassan? Hassan, aye. Hassan, aye. Representative Hertos? Hertos, no. Hertos, no. Representative Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Johnson? No. Johnson, no. Representative Krisha? Krisha, no. Krisha, no. Representative Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Lilly, aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Mariani, excused. Representative Marquardt? Marquardt, aye. Marquardt, aye. Representative Miller? Miller, no. Miller, no. Representative Nash? Nash, no. Nash, no. Representative Nelson? Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor? Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Representative O'Neill? O'Neill, no. O'Neill, no. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative Petersburg, excused. Representative Pinto? Pinto, aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Schumacher, excused. Representative Schultz? Schultz, aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Scott? No. Scott, no. Representative Sundin? Aye. Sundin, aye. Representative Hansen, excused. 16 ayes and eight nays. So there have been 16 ayes and eight nays. The motion prevails and House File 1342 as amended is recommended for placement on a general register and nonpartisan staff are directed to make any technical corrections and amend the title. Thank you, Chair Eklund and Chair Noor.